But first, we'll hear from from our colleagues on the panel. Second, after me comes comes Ann. Uh, I'm sorry, comes Tom Kent, who was assigned to the AP's Moscow Bureau from '76 to '81, with a year out to run the AP's coverage of the Iranian Revolution in Tehran in '79. Uh, Tom reported for the AP from Iran, Soviet Union, Sydney, and Brussels. He's now Deputy Managing Editor of the AP in charge of standards and ethics and teaching at the Columbia School of Journalism. Tom. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, indeed, I was there from 76 to 81, which was the Brezhnev period. And at that time, we had gotten to the point where we were able to have our own direct teletype connection from our office to um, AP in London. Um, there was no censorship. Um, <coughs> there also was very little information uh, that we could, we could get. So uh, it was a mixed blessing on the whole. Uh, we were uh, closely watched by the authorities. I think there were attempts very clearly to intimidate us. I can remember once going to a uh, one of these dissident news conferences of the type that Bob refers to, and I was walking across a darkened parking lot uh, to the apartment building, and suddenly out of nowhere, the headlights of a car came on, and the car came hurtling toward me and stopped three inches from me. And I thought to myself, you know, these guys are good. <laughs> the, the plan was to stop three inches from me, and they did. Now well, let's see. Uh, they are really professionals. I think that Western correspondents were barely tolerated uh, in the Soviet Union at that time. Um, there was really very little reason they wanted us there, but they wanted their own correspondents abroad, and they had signed by that point the Helsinki Agreements, um, agreeing to a certain amount of freedom of expression and exchange of correspondence, so they lived with us. Um, it was difficult, very difficult, to get official interviews. Um, we could, you know, contact these various Soviet ministries, departments, and so forth, and ask for interviews. And the answer would always be the same: "Napishite nam pismo," write us a letter. "Imwi budjem yuvo rasmatrivat," so we will review it. And they would rasmatrivat it for months on end. So uh, almost never could we get the kind of interviews that we felt that we needed. And the same thing was true uh, for contact with ordinary people, and that's what I regret the most, the lack of contact with ordinary people. It was as if people were programmed uh, to watch out for foreigners, as they were programmed to watch out for foreigners, but everybody seemed to be programmed to watch out for foreigners. Um, I can remember uh, one event, like the worst thing that can happen to a news agency correspondent in Moscow at the time. Uh, one night I got a call at home from New York saying the dreaded UPI, our uh, opposition, uh, was reporting a plane crash at Moscow Airport. Uh, and could we get it? Uh, well, no, we couldn't. Uh, UPI had just been incredibly lucky, I mean, given that it was a plane crash, but in journalistic terms, they've been incredibly lucky to just have had somebody at the airport at the time. Uh, no, we couldn't match it. We couldn't get out to the airport. The roads were blocked. We called all sorts of officials. Of course, they didn't know anything. Um, so finally, I called the, uh, uh, the Stolovaya, the, the, uh, the, the little, well, you know, the little uh, snack bar in the airport and talked to the Stolovia lady. And I said, you know, anything going on there, you know? And she said, everything's fine here. But later on, we heard they'd been carrying bodies through the Stolovia at that time. <laughs> but somehow, she knew not to engage <coughs> with us. Um, and I think that the Soviet authorities really did themselves a tremendous disservice uh, with their belief that it would be bad for the regime if there were more contact between us and ordinary Soviet people. The fact was, uh, as far as we could determine, and obviously we did talk to some real Soviets now and then, I was there for four and a half years, it, it happened now and then. Um, as far as we could determine, most people were sort of okay, uh, the way most of us are sort of okay uh, in our lives and in our world. I never sensed that the Soviet people <coughs> were on the edge of rebellion. Um, they knew that life was better in the West in terms of consumer goods and so forth. But, you know, I know life's better in Hollywood, and I don't cry myself to sleep every night so that I don't live like people there do. I 
my fate is uh, to live in Larchmont and, and, and live as I live. Um, and also there was no um, familiarity uh, with Western style freedoms and therefore I think no particular sense of, of their absence. Uh, we would talk to Soviets and, and mention freedom of the press in the United States and they would say, oh yeah, we've heard about that. That means that anyone can print pornography and sell it in public, right? I say, well, yeah, I'm not sure it's what the founding fathers had in mind, but, but yes, that's true. And they'd just sort of, aha, and, and there you are. And they had very deep suspicions of us. There was a night when there was a fire in the foreign ministry, in the, in the, um, the tower of the foreign ministry, and some of us came out to take pictures, and a uh, very angry old lady strode us up to us. I don't think she was a KGB officer. I think she was just an angry old lady. And noticing our shoes, which of course is the giveaway, said, are you foreigners? Are you foreign reporters? And we said, yeah. And she said, you're going to put a picture of that in the paper, right? We said, well, yeah. She said, so of all of the beautiful architectural monuments on this street, you're going to publish a picture of the one that's on fire. And I said, well, yeah, that's sort of what we do. Um, but it, it, it was clear that um, she was hardly a great uh, supporter of the Western press or Western concept of living. Um, now, it's true that, that Russians certainly knew that, um, that their life was difficult. Uh, and uh, you would see long lines everywhere, as many of you can remember, for consumer goods. Everyone carried a string bag just in case something interesting might be on sale. But from what I could see, the focus of people was not on blaming the authorities for this and organizing a revolution. The focus was, how can I get by? And somehow, with their extended families and someone who knew someone, and the fact that if their factory's Dom Kulturi, the you know, little theater in their, in their factory, was getting a film that a lot of people wanted to see, they had a few extra tickets, they could give that to the butcher, they could get some sausage. You know, if they succeeded, it, it hadn't been a wasted day. Uh, they, they, they could get along. So in being isolated from ordinary people and being cut off from official organizations, a lot of correspondents missed out a lot about the general acceptance of the system uh, and some of the accomplishments of the Soviet state. It could make a person an anti-Sovietic uh, living in that environment. Um, now, of course, as I say, you can be so open-minded that your brains fall out. Uh, the country was repressive. The economy was lousy. Uh, the government was involved in all sorts of plotting against the West. Um, uh, all of this had to be reported. But at the same time, um, I think there was probably an opening, if the Soviets had handled it better, to make us more aware of what the country was doing right, some progress that was being made, and improving their image. And I think in particular of Vyacheslav Fyodorov, uh, who was a Soviet ophthalmologist, who came up with an idea that, get this, the idea was that he could cut holes in your eyes and that would make you see better. Well, this was met with great mirth uh, by a lot of Westerners in Moscow and the American Ophthalmological Society, which, of course, would be the experts, said, oh, this is highly dangerous, oh, I would never do such a thing like that. And Vyacheslav Fyodorov never really did get much cred in the Western press. And, of course, this was the beginning of laser surgery, uh, and uh, he was a great <coughs> innovator in this area. Um, so I would just conclude by saying that Russia today, as we look at the life of, of correspondents in Russia and the opportunities of correspondents in Russia, despite the problems that continue to exist, for foreign correspondents in Russia, life is a dream in terms of access to many, many sources of information. And we can only hope that they will take every opportunity themselves to report every side of what's going on in Russia today. Thanks, Tom.